our additional children's times. We have guest soloists like Amalia and um, in addition to that, I'd like to thank the AV crew, because we don't always remember to thank them, the AV crew. Please join us, and please rise and body your spirit for the gathering song, 270, O Day of Light and Gladness, by Frederick Lucien Hosmer Robert Williams, written a 19th century Unitarian minister and set to a traditional Eastern hymn tune, Land Fair, Yan Fair, written by Robert Williams, a blind basket maker who lived on an island north of Wales.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Happy, Easter. happy Easter. And also, happy Trans Day of Visibility. We're grateful to be celebrating all of that today. <laughs> Welcome to all of our special guests and special guest musicians. We're really grateful to have everyone here. And we are so glad to see all of you as well, whether you're here every week, whether this is your first time back after a while, or whether you're here for the first time either here in the sanctuary or joining us via our live stream, we are so grateful to have you. And we are also grateful to welcome our guests from our Winter Nights program especially as well. Thanks, so welcome to everyone. It's great. So if you are visiting us for the first time and you would like to stay in touch with us, please fill out a visitor's card either at the table or um, on our website so we can keep being in touch with you. And if you are in need of a listening ear today, because sometimes holidays are hard, uh, we invite you to um, talk to one of our pastoral listeners or to um, Travis after the service today. So if you, if you could use a listening ear, we are here to listen. Uh, after our service today, uh, please stay for our egg hunt. Even if you aren't planning on hunting for eggs yourself, it is a lot of fun to watch others hunt for eggs. <laughs> Uh, it will begin as close to noon as is possible. Um, so just kind of stick around by noon or so. If you want to participate, try to be in the patio area. That will be great. Um, and so we're grateful for that. It is, we are privileged to be hosting our families from Winter Nights for this last week and the week to come. So for today, if you are, if you are able, we ask you, willing and able, we ask you to use the um, restrooms either in the Gil Martin building after service or there is a restroom at the corner of the white building. Um, for those who that is too long of a trip, feel free to use those other restrooms, but we are trying to minimize the number of people using those restrooms while our guests are here. So welcome everyone to this beloved community. Good morning. My name is Jana Contreras, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. My pronouns are she and her. Welcome to our service. Wonderful music today, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church is a welcoming faith community. We begin our services by reading our mission together. We bring to life our Unitarian Universalist values as we seek truth and work for justice, nurture compassion and courage, reach out to each other and to our larger community of faith, bridge the divisions that wound the human family, transform ourselves and our world. Spring is a great time to get involved. Check out the weekly email and Beacon newsletter for the many, many things which are happening here. Sign-ups for the new round of Community Circles is beginning, and it's a great way to meet people. We are so glad to have you with us. Our expectation is that those who are attending in person have no symptoms of any of the communicable things that are still, yes, still going around. Thank you for honoring this commitment to keep one another safe. A few announcements. We hope that you will take a moment today to shop at our Spring Fling online auction as today is the last day. So do it today, gotta do it today. This is a very important fundraiser for the church and a way to honor all those who donated and organized this fundraiser. And welcome, it's good to be together. So this is the time in our service when we greet one another. And there's really only one other thing I can say about that on Easter, which is hop to it.
And um, I'm lighting the chalice this morning. Well, Travis is lighting it. I'm sitting here. Uh, with the words of Mike A. Johnson, I can't control what my government is doing right now. Jesus had no political power. He lived his whole life in the shadow of the Roman Empire, and that empire killed him. Yet he was able to respond to act. Jesus prayed, he taught, he healed the sick, he listened, he moved among the ordinary people in the lowly places. He didn't concern himself very often with the emperor or king or governor. He was clear that those powers were evil. Rather, he went directly to the poor, the oppressed, the sick, those were the ones who caught the eye of the divine blessing. And later, he offered this measure by which all people were judged. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Whatsoever you do for the least of these, my relatives, you do for me. Thank you. Thank you. Is it time? Yeah. I want to say something about the bell choir. Um, I really appreciate we had um, extra helpers like Shelley and Kevin uh, pull this together. And um, in addition, they helped make an arrangement in memory of Richard Armstrong, um, who passed over a year ago, and uh, also made arrangements of bell choir music, um, that specific piece, Hallelujah, for us and for instruments. Um, and then I also want to thank our keyboardists like Amalia, Brett, Liam, Kevin, um, and our section leaders of the choir. <clears throat> now please, um, we have special guest singer soloists as well, T Talia, my daughter, and Shannon, my friend. Um, <laughs> and now they're gonna help us lead 1068, Rising Green. Please rise and body your spirit for this hymn, 1068, Rising Green, by Carolyn McDade. This hymn was by Carolyn McDade, invites us to the awareness of our unity with the natural world.
working. I'd like to invite those who are young and young at heart to come forward for a time for all ages. And please come process down this middle aisle and there's lots of room for you over here. It's so good to see you all. Yeah, let's, let's, we're going to scoot over so you can make room for a few more friends. Wonderful. Oh, my goodness, this hat. I know, the hat is beautiful. This, this is the Easter Bonnet Award right here. <laughs> all right, well, Easter time is here again. This is a bit of a confusing holiday for us. I agree. However, it does have many cute animals that we think of this time of year, like baby bunnies and rabbits and chicks. And, 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 uh, wait, who is that? <gasps> wait, did I see somebody? Hmm. I think it's eggs. Well, <laughs> we'll get to you later. Yes. Let's see who's here with us. Does anybody want to be a bunny? Does anybody want to be a bunny? Oh, I see a bunny hand over here. What about a chick? Does anybody want to be? Oh, I see a chick over here. A uh, sheep? Anybody want to be a sheep? What about a fox? <gasps> we have some foxes, some chipmunks. Any chipmunks? Uh, what am I missing? Oh, I see a fox. Okay. How about a duck? Oh, a kitty cat. I see a kitty cat. A and she a duck. Yep. She, 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 sheep and chipmunks and foxes. I think this is a different story than the one I thought we were doing. Oh, no worries. More animals make it better, <laughs> especially a confusing kind of story like Easter. Hmm, well, it is part of our heritage, and maybe it's good to know a little bit about. What do you find confusing? Well, to begin with, you have the Easter bunny. Why, yes. <gasps> Why, yes. Oh, there they are my right now. Oh, goodness. Yes, yes. Oh boy, here comes that egg-laying rabbit. An egg-laying rabbit? What are you talking about? That's the rumor. Oh no, that would be terrible. It could put us chickens out of business. Rabbits have big families that they could lay a lot of eggs. Like Bluey, my favorite dog on TV. He has a huge family with so many aunts and uncles. And... Are we talking about Bluey? No. We're talking about a glut in the market for eggs, which could have a devastating effect on chickens' futures. Oh, well then, can I talk about Paw Patrol? Um, they also have a lot of characters. Or the movie Sing, because I really like the song that the pig sings. I could do one of the songs right now. Don't distract me. This is important. Us cluckers could go out of business. Let's find out what's going on. Uh, hey, Easter Bunny, come on over here. Just, you know, this way. There you go. Pass Don Green. He won't bite. <laughs> this is a bunny of very few words. Well, <laughs> no words, as far as I can tell. They're pretty nonverbal. Maybe Bunny is sad? You mean sad like Elsa from Frozen? Please, and no, you cannot sing for the first time in forever. I get it. You want me to let it go? <laughs> Make them stop. <laughs> well, this proves we all have stories that we know, and this Easter story is another story for us to know. Like Toy Story? Uh, more classic than that. Oh, like the Little Mermaid. Mm, back a little further. Woody from Toy Story would be really good at looking for eggs. More on that later. Marina's right. You do know a lot of stories. Here's another one about Ostera. Ostera was the Saxon goddess who was connected to the story uh, the dawn, of the dawn and rebirth of spring. Those are good things. Was she the egg-laying rabbit? Uh, no. However, some of her best friends were rabbits. That's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sometimes she took the form of a rabbit so she could hang out with rabbits in their world. Like Wreck-It Ralph, he wants to be in other worlds, well, other video games. Just ignore them. Well, 
We all have the stories that give meaning to our lives. And because eggs were a symbol of new life and of abundance, the goddess who was a rabbit laid eggs. And that's why the Easter Bunny brings them now. Brings them, but does not lay them? Right. Well, that is a relief. At least you don't have to file that cease and desist order. <laughs> Changing form. Like the genie from Aladdin? Now that's an ancient Disney movie, probably the oldest movie in the world. <laughs> you do know a lot of stories. And now you know a little bit about the Easter story. Maybe this is a good time for a song. Um, animals, can I hear some animal sounds? Oh, finally, the part where the pig sings. Oh, you guys can do better than that. I need to hear way more animal sounds. <laughs> Louder animal sounds. There we go. Oh. <laughs> a whole story and a song and no pig sang. Speaking of pigs, have you ever watched Peppa Pig? Anyone? We're gonna take a moment and have our song with singing eggs. Body or spirit for basket of plums, and when I rise, words by Wendell Mer Berry and music by Wendy Tuck. Words were adapted by a poem by Wendell Berry, music by Wendy Tuck, um, and with Joseph Emmett and Max West from the Plum Village community of Ticknock Han. Okay, that song was nice and all, but seriously, has anyone ever seen Peppa Pig? Anyone? Excuse me, is it time to find us yet? No more stories. We are done with stories. They create threats to my livelihood. Well, there might be one more. Pinocchio, Bugs Bunny, Finding Nemo, Howl's Moving Castle. I think Marina meant Easter. You already said the Easter Bunny doesn't lay eggs, so you going on is no skin off my back. Wow, I wonder where that expression came from. Uh, probably another story. Yes, that's true, but we're not telling that one now. We're going to tell the story of the Easter Bunny and uh, how that old holiday got tied into the Christian story about the religious leader Jesus and what happened after people tried to make him stop his teaching. Oh, I know that story. Talk about confusing. <laughs> I agree. Worse than singing pigs. And egg-laying bunnies. Yes, although it's kind of an odd combination. Our celebration of Easter got tied to the story of what happened after Jesus died. The bunnies and the eggs? How does that even make sense? I bet it's about power or market share. Power's right. 
tying the story of the rebirth of the promise of Jesus to the stories around the rebirth of spring made them more popular. Like when you binge watch Disney Channel. Yeah, kind of like that. Don't some people say that Jesus rose from the dead? That doesn't make sense. No, not any more than an egg-laying rabbit, but just like the ancient peoples, the ones even before Aladdin, I know it's hard for you to imagine that. In fact, it was thought to be amazing that life came back after the dead of winter. And so Jesus' friends remembered his ideas and what he had taught them, and those teachings allowed him to live on in a new way. That's not how I heard the story. There are a couple of versions. For us with our UU roots, this is the story that we remember on this day, that Jesus was a Jewish leader who wanted to help make his people remember their values. And through his community, he taught that the power of love and action was very great and very powerful. I hesitate to say this, but like a superpower? Even more than Superman or Batwoman or Spider-Man or Spider-Man from the Spider-Verse or... Have I mentioned that you know a lot of stories? You can say that again. Okay, one more, the short version. Like a little clip? Right, because you know why we need stories. They help us remember things we don't want to forget, and that's why we tell some stories over and over again each year. So maybe now you all will know this story as well. A story about how things that we have loved and lost might return to us in different forms. Like Beauty and the Beast. Just like the plants come back from the spring, even from the twigs that look so dead. What do all of our animals say to that? Can I hear some animal noises again? <laughs> oh, we're getting a hissing cat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, wait. Exactly. Now is it our turn? Almost. We are going to talk about finding you anyway. Well, it's beautiful to have all these animals and all of these great stories with us. This is the kind of morning it is. No pigs sang, no bunnies laid eggs, and still we're glad to be in community, the kind which we believe, I believe Jesus imagined. And there are eggs, and they will be revealed unto you in just a little while. <laughs> I bet Marina would like to tell you about that. Mm -hmm. All right, now, I need everybody to put on their listening ears. Our listening ears. I don't see our listening ears. Oh, thank you. The congregation is helping us. Okay, it is time for us to talk about egg etiquette, or rather, egg etiquette. <laughs> Let's hatch a plan to make sure our excellent Easter egg hunt is a safe egg experience for everybody. <laughs> Remember, we need to keep our eyes peeled for any tripping hazards, and we need to expect the unexpected. Don't be surprised if you find some extra special prizes hidden in your eggs. Now let's not get too excited and run around like a bunch of wild Easter bunnies if you get my drift. Oh. <laughs> we want to make sure that everybody can hunt for eggs safely and that we all have an exemplary time. So when you find your eggs, please don't put all your eggs in one basket. After all, egg hunters do not want to be shellfish. Share your eggs with your friends and family and see if you can find some more egg-siding hiding spots to explore. Our playground area, which is located over here, will be designated for kiddos who are five and younger, as well as kids who need a nut-free hiding egg experience. Our Easter Bunny will be located near the labyrinth and will be ecstatic to take some egg photos with you. Lastly, I would like to invite you to experiment with different ways to hunt for these eggs. Try hopping like a bunny, waddling like a duck, or even exploring the church grounds to find the best hiding spots. And all of our eggs will be hidden either in the nut-free zone on the playground or out on the brick patio, the upper patio, or the labyrinth area. And our hunt will begin exactly after service is done. And we'll wait for Reverend Leslie's cue. And uh, as egg hunters, we don't want to ignore these expectations. So let's have an exceptional Easter egg hunt all together. And we're going to practice hopping on our way out. Yeah. And 
now, I would like my fellow egg hunters to join me in practicing on our bunny hop. We are actually going to follow our bunny hop guide here. So can everybody rise and get into bunny hop positions? Let's do the bunny hop. That was pretty cute. <laughs> Hi, my name is Travis McPhee. My pronouns are he and him. It is good to be here with you, gathered as a community on this Easter day. Easter holds many meanings. I grew up finding candy in plastic eggs, hearing about an Easter bunny. But it was also a day of family gathering in care and love. Easter is a Christian holiday that holds an invitation to remember, as was discussed before, stories, especially the story of Jesus, his death and his rebirth. In the story written and told of Jesus' life and death and life again, he did things that seem impossible. Even though his life was taken away, even though he died, he came back to life. Sometimes this is called resurrection, which comes from the Latin word for rise again. That's a very big story, not only because it's quite unusual, but also because lots of people talk about it, believe in it, and care about it. Because I went to a UU divinity school, we didn't have to study the Christian Bible, but still I felt called to read it and to study it. This is because there's something special about a book that so many people were touched by. Even those of us who have never read the biblical story of Jesus, I believe are still influenced by it because it's embedded deeply into the culture into our social psychology. Examining the story of Jesus may help us learn about ourselves and about the power of stories to influence. Even if we try to push it away, the story of Jesus influences our values, impacts what matters to us. And though we may want to move beyond the stories of religions at times, we can't ignore how religions acted as parents in our historical moral development. Stories are powerful for us. They hold and send messages, and how we tell a story matters. We often focus on telling stories with our words, and what we say matters, but even more importantly, what we do, how we act, matters. The story we send through our actions is deep and meaningful because we choose to become that story, to live it. A life acting out the story and values that matter most to us may be the most profound message we can give. Live the story you want to tell, and it will be very hard to ignore. 
The story I receive from Jesus, a story hard to ignore, is a story of dedication to love and faith in love. And that though the body that lives can be killed, the spirit of love cannot. When love is killed, it will always rise again. More powerful than a single individual holding the power of love and rising again is love held in each of us together. If someone tries to get rid of the people they see holding love, it rises again in each of us. This is the most powerful way I know to tell a story, to live it together. Not just a single group, but a group of beings so large, we may not even know who we are living this story with. We just do our part and trust love, put our faith in love and each other. May we gather today in that spirit. How beautiful are the feet of them who preached the gospel's peace by handle. Now I want to invite us all into a shared space that reminds us how our intellect has limits. This is the space between what we know with our scientific minds and our personal lived experiences, and then all of those other things that still remain mysterious to us. Some people have called the gap between this the god of the gap, and others the great mystery of life. Rather than name something that I believe can't be named, I invite you now into community, a space where we can lay down our own selfishness and become open to connecting with others. 
This is a place where we remind ourselves of all of those desires, hopes, and values that we hold in our hearts and where we lift our desperation for making them manifest. On this Easter Sunday, I invite you to commune with our Unitarian Universalist ancestors and embrace a heart of a heretic as we reimagine the Easter story as more than just a story about death and rebirth, but also a journey of transformation. I invite you now into this, our time for the deep ask of prayer. Great spirit of the old and new, grant us the strength to cast off our hardened hearts and transform them into tender reeds bending against the winds of time and change. Remind us that the embrace of our community is where growth and renewal can be found. Today, we honor those transgender siblings in our midst on this day of trans visibility. Let us witness the power and beauty of embracing our true selves that this community teaches us. And just as Jesus was crucified on a cross and entombed under the specter of death, may we learn to lay down our own egos and ready our hearts for something new and precious. Give us the hope and faith of the early Christian women who went to the tomb to tend to the body only to find a stone rolled away and an empty grave. Perhaps we too can find a way to allow our egos to reduce so small that there is room for something new to come into being. Perhaps we can resurrect a new, greater sense of connection and community with others, or maybe, just maybe, we can learn from those trans folks in our midst that we can become who we are meant to be and allow others to do the same. Dear spirit of old and new things, guide us in the process of shedding all that is old and embracing the new. Help us to see through our loving eyes those things that bring us peace and wholeness in our journey towards becoming our full and authentic selves. And also, may this country one day awaken to the horrors of hate that have been placed at the feet of those trans siblings we honor today. May those laws, hate-filled hearts and minds, and pernicious powers die off and be resurrected anew. In the name of resurrection, transformation, and authenticity, we pray collectively today. Amen, ashe, and blessed be. There's a story that um, during Handel's um, long oratorio that we're taking an excerpt from, that the king stood because he was so moved um, it might be that he had to stretch his legs, but no, nonetheless, you're welcome to rise in the body of spirit if you wish for Handel's Hallelujah Chorus.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mark Chase. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. Each morning as I wake up, I go downstairs, I turn on the coffee maker in my home, and then uh, I typically open up the New York Times app on my phone while the coffee maker is heating up and start the day with some of their word puzzles. I first started doing the Wordle puzzle as the craze swept the nation in 2021 during the pandemic. I freely admit I do not have the patience, the time, or the brain power to try and tackle the full New York Times crossword puzzle uncaffeinated. <laughs> Thankfully, I know I'm not alone because there's a smaller mini crossword available for the tired and impatient like me. And I see many heads nodding, so thank you, my people. I, see, I feel seen and heard. Just last year, a new game premiered called Connections. The Connections game presents you with 16 different squares of words that seemingly have little to do with one another. The goal of the game is to sort the 16 words presented into four categories of four words, each of which have something in common. You only get four incorrect guesses, so you must think about your work and choose carefully. As I work through the possibilities, it's always amusing to discover what unites the different word pairs and how the puzzle creator came up with the matches. I also love that the game is called Connections. When I think about our community here at Mount Diablo, I see some similar themes to the game. When many of us sought out this community as adults who are not raised in this faith tradition, we were looking for connection. We are a diverse group of individuals that are multi-generational, multicultural, multiracial, perhaps slightly bookish, and so on. You get the idea. I love that each time I leave a service or an event here, I feel uplifted, challenged, and yes, connected. On this Easter morning, please consider giving generously to sustain our community so that people may continue to arrive here seeking, seeking connection. If you're joining us online, uh, there is a yellow Give Now button on the MDUC website. And here in the sanctuary, I invite the ushers forward to greatly, gratefully accept your offerings.
the dedication to our offering, the words are found on the screen. To the work of this community in transforming ourselves and our world, we dedicate ourselves and our offerings. A good story, just as with a good poem, holds the truth that's larger than words. And Easter, this ancient story, this ancient mashup of stories, is about rising. And what is it that this Easter poem today, for us whose faith is intertwined with reason, two parts flower and one part new life and one part evasive truth, captures for us? Those of you who worship here regularly know that we run a multi-voiced service, and that means that often I get to this point. And all the time that I had to say what I was going to say has been filled with other beautiful voices and offerings, which today we have had quite a few. But guess what? I have a few things I want to say today. <laughs> this is why I said that the hunt will begin 12-ish. <laughs> so if you need to stretch, feel free. It won't be that long, but just a little bit. Now, the Easter story isn't the kind of writing that's done by a journalist, like that kind of verbal autopsy where you take things down, bone after bone, organ after organ, until the whole inner workings are revealed. The Easter story is more like that fictional form that's one of my favorites, which is called magical realism. And if you don't know what that is, think water for chocolate, think 100 years of solitude. It sets a story in an ordinary place, but the extraordinary is present there as well, and the outcome is always unpredictable. Does that feel like the world we're living in today? Yeah. I love that kind of writing. I think that it takes us beyond the world that we know to the world that we need to know which includes a place of hope. And on this day, March 31st, 2024, is there anyone out there that could actually use a dose of hope? Anyone out there? Thank you, thank you. Anyone who's lost someone that they loved, and in 2024, that's almost everybody that I know, understands the way that people live on in us, in what they loved, in the organizations and the people that they touched. And anyone who lives in this year also understands how deceit can slip inside the cracks of any story. It happens. The late great Episcopal rabble-rouser John Shelby Spong wrote, the Easter story appears to have grown rather dramatically over the years. Something happened after the crucifixion of Jesus that convinced the disciples that Jesus shared in the eternal life of God and was thus available to them as a living presence. And this experience, Fong said, was so profound that the disciples who at his arrest had fled in fear were now reconstituted and empowered even to die for the truth of their vision. This experience had the power to force the Jewish disciples to redefine the God of the Jews so that Jesus could be seen as part of of who God is, this experience was so profound that it ultimately created, on the first day of the week, a new holy day, quite different from the Sabbath, to enable Christians to mark this transforming moment with a liturgical act called the breaking of the bread. And the breaking of the bread is nestled as we are right now in community. So from this story, something rose, something powerful. In this time of fascism birthing, climate change denying, democracy mocking, when babies, so many babies, so many children around our world are dying, we need a story about the ability to rise. Does anyone need that story today? Anyone out there? Yes. It's a story about a man whose ideas of being inclusive, of loving the ones that others have shunned, were seen as too dangerous. Does anyone need that story today? Pastor Jackie Lewis of Middle Church in New York has preached about all the things she doesn't need to rise again. Tyranny and injustice and ignorance disguised as faith and power that keeps some poor and others super rich. 
Now, I'm not without the spirit and power of discernment, and I know that most people come to this place on this Sunday because it's fun to watch the kids hunt from eggs, and there's always amazing music, and wasn't there today? Just amazing. But maybe in 2024, we're trying to sidle up to another truth, to be reminded of the power of another story that isn't as diverting as the ones we binge watch, the ones we play through on the game screens, or even the ones we tell ourselves about our own weakness so that we can disconnect from the pain that is around us. Today, we might need a spirit of hope, a spirit that is powerful a magical realism about a community that loved their leader so much that when he died and they thought they couldn't go on, they realized that what he had taught them was in them already, that they were creating it, that it was something they knew, that it was something they could continue to liberate the world with, that they were the bearers of that hope even though they never thought of themselves that way in the time in which they were all gathered together they knew that something needed to rise up. Hope needed to rise up. Is this a story for our time? I think it is. It's a story about a time when it feels as if hope could be dead, when we feel like choices are curtailed, when we are chilled by the movements of the time, and we too need that hope. But we need the hope in the context of the writer Ray Bradbury who said, hope is action. There is no hope without action. I would say that hope without action is just another form of spiritual bypass. And too many of us are framing our lives in the narrative that nothing we do matters, and so those of us who can should just take our toys and go home. And what I would ask you to do on this Easter morning, this Easter morning in 2024, is to make another choice. To think about how we create together hope, the strong and evasive kind that lives between the words that we can't quite say, can't quite know, but we know it's there. That we create together a place where our actions counter the oppression that many among us feel today and where those that don't understand and are willing to learn of its terrors. Can we be the people of that hope? Hope that we will support one another in looking into the eyes of the children in Gaza and Yemen or the children around the world who are facing a lack of the basic needs of life in a world that still has plenty. Can we be the place of that hope? Hope that we will act to provide shelter for our neighbors here in the Bay Area who cannot afford roofs over their heads Hope that ends our hypnosis with the idea that we, who have so much, need more before we can act to help make the change that we can. Is there anybody out there this morning who would be willing to rise with that kind of hope? What story is shaping your life? And does it have some room to push away some things and make room for hope, active hope, creative hope in our hearts today? To give some of our energy to co-create and fan into flame those little nascent ideas that live between the world. With that kind of hope, I do believe that we will rise again. Speaking of rising, please rise and body your spirit to help join us sing the closing song, 1036, Calypso Alleluia by Thomas Benjamin. 
Alleluia is a word that combines rejoicing, praise, and gratitude. This song uses the calypso rhythms of Caribbean people who have known suffering and oppression and yet who have shared a great gift for celebration with the world. We will sing all the Alleluia verses and then we will sing the Blessed Be verses. When we get to Blessed Be verses, that's going to be choose your own adventure so you can sing whatever line you want. Shannon will sing one line one over and over again. Talia will sing line two over and over again, and I will sing line three over and over again. Liam and Brett will just improvise and have fun like they always do. Thank you. And let us just take a moment and be grateful for all the gifts of this service, especially our guests, musicians. And we extinguish our chalice with these words from the Reverend Jackie Lewis. The only saved world we are going to have is the one we can imagine. So let us take our imaginations and our sense of peace out into the world and let us give it as a gift. 